Welcome to Our Jewish Roots. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Faith for the future, our journey with the patriarchs. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif, and I'd like to remind you what Jesus said. Sometimes we have to pick up our cross and follow him. We see that not just in the Newer Testament, but the Old Testament, correct? And we've been walking through Abraham and Sarah's journey. We can say those names now, they're extended new names. And today's kind of the biggie, isn't it? It's the Moriah experience that I we mean, kind of know Abraham for. It, it's a tough story. Go sacrifice your kid, you know? I mean, it's, say what? Mm. <laughs> it's a tough assignment. It really is. And then he buries his wife, too. That's another toughie. I know. It's, yes. it's, it's a hard one today, but it's part of his journey of faith, and it's necessary to see what he had to walk through, like so many of us have walked through yeah, as, face. as we journey through life, I think we all get bounced around a little bit. You know, it just happens. Yep. In our drama today, Abraham is ready to encounter his ultimate test of faith, followed by Barry's insight regarding our obedience to the Lord. Let's go there now. And it came to pass after these things, that God tested Abraham. And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. אנחנו ממשיכים מכאן. אנחנו עולים לעבוד את אדוני. נחזור אחר כך. אבא, העצים אצלי, האש אצלך, איפה הסלע עולה? as Abraham is prepared to carry out what God has called him to do with his son, Isaac. What a challenge that any parent has regarding their own child. A dear friend of mine recently had to bury her daughter who died of natural causes. That's outside the proper order of things. The children should bury the parents, not the parents bury the child. But here we see Abraham's obedience. Hebrews 12 exhorts us to keep our eyes on Jesus, Yeshua, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And then also in Romans 4, Paul reminds us about Abraham, yet with respect to the promise of God, Abraham, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Nothing is complete without the cross, and yet the cross is at the end of the story, is it? This journey, this call of obedience was not the end of the story. The resurrection, the empty tomb is the fulfillment of the promise that we have in Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. We know that through our trials, 
always the best is yet to come. That's the kind of Savior that we love, that we can put our hope in when it seems as though all hope is lost. He's the yes and the amen, and we can trust Him, even with a difficult call of obedience that we saw with Abraham. Barry just mentioned this call to obedience, and I've got to be honest, I don't think if God told me, sacrifice that beautiful son, or our firstborn Tyler, I don't think I would have said yes. You? Well, I don't know, you know, <laughs> if he's a teenager, I thought <laughs> I threatened to kill my kids every now and again. I was joking, of course, and I'm joking now. No, that's a tough one. That's a tough order to fill. But do you, uh, don't you believe, and the scripture tells us, right, that Abraham had enough faith for the future that God would raise his son up if he had to kill him? That's a lot of faith. Yeah, and that's an incredible statement. We find it in the Newer Testament, and uh, kudos to him for that. Right now, let's go to our drama as Abraham takes Isaac to the altar. Sarah, <laughs> This series is about faith for the future. And the 22nd chapter of Genesis, Bereshit, is important in that regard for both Jews and Christians. Jews refer to it as the story of the Akita, the binding of Isaac. Christians refer to the story as a, a typological picture of the father Abraham taking his miracle born son Isaac, taking him to Mount Moriah and sacrificing him. Well, prevented from doing so with the word according to uh, chapter 22, verse 7, uh, Vayomer Avraham Elohim Yereh, and Abraham said, God will provide. And the argument is the ultimate provision was when God did himself provide a sacrifice on Mount Moriah years later in the person of his son, Yeshua. It's a fascinating story, and it's judged to be a picture, a snapshot in Old Testament prophecy that takes us to the story of Yeshua. Here I am, you've heard of the beginnings of the Jesus story in uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, we learn about uh, uh, the young Jesus. Two different stories. Actually, it's the Lucan story that gets us here uh, in the manger. When the wise men show up in the Matthew story, they don't come uh, to a cave. Uh, they come to a home. They don't engage a child a newborn, but rather a young lad who's around two years of age, according to the Matthew story. It's in Luke we hear about Yeshua born and placed in a manger. Of course, this looks a little different. We're used to Woodstock for the major, 
the manger. However, in antiquity, you go back to the Jewish world, they had better things to do with wood than chop it up all the time. In fact, we probably need to rethink the story of Jesus and his father Joseph being carpenters. Better to speak of stonemasons. Certainly they're in the construction business, but there wasn't a lot of cutting up wood. Here we have an example of a feeding trough. You'll see it right here, and of course there's hay on top, and arguably the Christ child was put on something like this. This is a softer place to begin. He ended on harder boards now, didn't he? And that's the gospel story, that's the gospel truth, and we see a snapshot of that, as I'd said, in the story of Genesis chapter 22. Just to repeat it, because it is so worth hearing, uh, especially for someone like me. It's really important for someone like my wife and myself of Jewish extract to see the Jesus story and the Jewish story. Uh, that's really important. There's, there's the father, Avraham. There's a woman who cannot bear. She's barren. There's a miracle that takes angelic uh, visitation. It takes divine impartation. She gives birth to this son, miracle-born son from a womb that couldn't produce. And then this child is told by his father to go take a walk up Moriah. And the father Abraham takes that son Yitzchak and they go up the mountain. I want to talk about faith for the future. And when I think of that, I wonder about Abram's state of mind at the time for he is about to plunge a dagger into the breast of the future, or so it seems. This is a man who's thoroughly committed to the belief that God holds the key to the future, not the circumstances as he sees them at the moment. Now, to be sure, he loves his son. This was a hard assignment, to be sure, a test, as it's noted elsewhere in Scripture. He passed it. And what enabled him to pass it and to get past the moment was a belief in a God who can get him past the difficult moments on into the future. Some of you may be living in proximity to dying dreams. Maybe you killed them. And a lot of people wonder, is there hope? Even now, is there hope? Is the conversation about faith for the future just something that TV personalities talk about with open Bibles? Or is it something that you can think about in the life that you live right now? Well, listen, this story in Genesis 22 wasn't on the big screen. This story was just a man making his journey through life, a man who walked by faith, a man who believed that God had the key, and he walked by faith and believed God for a future. Do you wonder about your future as a believer in the Messiah? Our founder, Zola Levitt, wrote a booklet that tells us what lies ahead. Glory, the future of the believers. Inside, Zola explains the coming rapture, our time in heaven, the kingdom on earth, and then eternity. Find out what God has prepared for those that love him. Call 1-800-WONDERS or go to levitt.com. I was talking to some friends the other day who were making plans for their vacation. I believe they were going to Hawaii or somewhere. Uh, so I can't remember exactly Tropical. what it was. Yes. <laughs> and I said, why don't you plan a trip to Israel with us? And they hadn't even thought about that, but they perked up when we told them how amazing our trips to Israel are. We would love for you to join us. Maybe you haven't thought about it before. It's life-changing. 
We would love for you to join us on a tour. You can find all the information on Levitt.com. We tell people, save up your pennies, save up your dollars, and they'll add up, they'll stack up, and you can go to Israel with us. Yes. Speaking of dollars. It's true as well. When people invest in the Lord's work, they're laying up their dollars in the bank of heaven. Uh, with that said, uh, begging your indulgence, let me inquire of you whether you'd be willing to support and help not this program, but this witness. Uh, your dollars translate into a testimony in the world. It's a gospel testimony, but we look at the good news through the eyes of the Jews, and we have to rely on yous to do it, please. We're looking at a program, Sacrifices at Play in the Literature. It's been like that from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're all participating in the drama of expanding his kingdom on earth. Let me encourage you to be sacrificial and help us do it through this ministry. Our ministry is known for the wonderful dramatic reenactments. You helped make that possible. Now let's go back to our story as our beloved Sarah passes on. Sarah died in Hebron, in the land of Canaan, and Abraham paid 400 shekels of silver for the cave of Machpelah for a burying place. Abraham bought the field of Machpelah and the cave therein, and all the trees that were in the field. In so many ways, Sarah was the lamp, the light of Abraham's life. We come to a place in the literature today, however, in the 23rd chapter of Genesis, when the light went out. Abraham finds himself in a tough place. We're looking at the literature at some tough space. In the Jewish world, this portion of the text is called Chaye Sarah, which translates as the life of Sarah, but truth be known, uh, the literature speaks more to her death and shows something about Abraham as he looks to the future, as he remembers his past. And I think, by the way, that those that are faith-filled and looking to the future, one of the ways that we articulate that, one of the ways that we attest to that is how we remember the past. And what's particularly striking for my money in literature is the dignity, the solemnity with which Abraham deals with the loss of his beloved. We're told in uh, chapter 23, verse 2, when we're told that Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and that he wept over her. It's, it's a tender moment. It's time to say goodbye. There's beauty here, there's dignity there. And sometimes the way that we deal with death is an attestation of the way that we deal with life. It shows value, it shows virtue. And I might say, by the way, that I think Christians have a lot of trouble dying. In the Jewish world, there's a set trajectory of how we deal with death. 
Let me explain that to you and talk to you about how this under, is understood within the context of faith for the future. In the Jewish world, when someone dies, they're interred immediately. And the family members will throw the dirt uh, into the grave. There's a kind of finality there that's telegraphed to the principal parties who are mourning. Subsequent to that, in the Jewish world, there's a period of mourning. It's called Shiva. It's a week. And in a Jewish home, uh, all the mirrors are covered. Uh, the family doesn't sit on couches. They sit on wooden stools. Uh, it's a time to grieve. Men don't shave. Women aren't putting on makeup and cologne. People are coming over to the home to bring food and to comfort those that are grieving. But the way that we comfort in the Jewish world is when you visit someone who's grieving, you say nothing. Because, you know, when people show up, they want to encourage, oh, God bless, Johnny was a great guy, and yeah, I remember this and that. In the Jewish world, you say nothing. You sit next to the person who's mourning and wait for them to speak. If they want to cry, you cry with them. If they want to reminisce, you reminisce with them. If they want to be angry at God for the loss, you let them vent. It's all about accompanying the mourner. It's all about accompanying the person who's grief on the journey. It's not about trying to bottle up grief. It's to let it, you know, energies run their course. And I think we see this in play in the literature. In the Jewish world, there's seven days of mourning. It notes here that Abram mourns. Subsequent to which then there's a 30-day period called Shloshim. Uh, not everyone can be in the state of shock and awe, you know, not shaving, cologne, sitting on benches, and just sitting in the house. And, uh, but through the 30-day period in the aftermath, um, you know, people are still in a state of shock. In the Jewish world, on the 30th day, the rabbi will come to the home and take the mourners for a walk around the block. It's a symbolic gesture. You don't need to say anything. It's a way of telegraphing, you know, the death has happened, and uh, it's, we got to get out there again and, and live again and dream again and love again. Jews toast with the expression l'chaim, which means to life. Uh, we celebrate the lives of those who live with us, but subsequent to that, then we have to go on and reach for the future. In the Jewish world, if, uh, someone, if someone's engaged to be married and the wedding is set for one day, and a father or mother or a significant person in the family dies two days beforehand, you don't cancel the wedding. Now, in other cultures, it would be deemed an insult to the departed. But in the Jewish world, the engines of life uh, have to outperform the engines of death, decay, despair, disorientation, and death. I mention that here. There's something beautiful. When you look at Abraham, it's time to say goodbye. And he does, and he does so gently. He does so tenderly. And then in his own time, he lifts himself up and reaches into the future himself. In short order, he'll go meet his maker as well. We're all on a journey from the womb to the tomb, as I like to say, and there are road bumps on the highway of life. Sometimes it's time to say goodbye. But what's over for us when we run our earthly trek, it's not over for God. We are beckoned to be torchbearers. We are beckoned to be a light in this world, to dispel the darkness. But there comes a point in time when the lamp runs out of oil. And those of us who make our earthly trek go on to our reward. And it's a reward in heaven. It's a reward for walking by faith. And it's what we get, those of us who walk with God and live with Him and have faith in Him for the future. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. 
view it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. We believe in lifetime learning. We love learning things. We love learning things from you, especially with the Jewish perspective. And you brought the Jewish perspective on grieving. And it's a longer process time that kind of we go through now. Yes, we do. And to your first point, it's great to learn. And uh, it's insightful to learn about the grieving process as well, because that's part of life for all of us. I would say you're still learning yourself, yes? Yes, I'm a student so yes. uh, at Cambridge University. In fact, I go back and forth across the pond in England, and uh, I want to continue to grow. And I'm 65. When they accepted me, I thought, wait a minute, do they know how old I am? <laughs> and I inquired, by the way. I wanted to know if I was the oldest student that ever went there. Wow. <laughs> the oldest took a PhD at 92. Uh, <laughs> you're close. You're close. <laughs> I should have waited kidding. a few years before I applied. But it's great to learn, and learning to deal with loss Oh, it's a toughie. I've walked in the valley of the shadow of death, and you have. And it's just, it's part of the living experience, uh, learning to do it gracefully with faith. Uh, uh, these biblical characters had to do it. We all do. And it's, it was part of Abraham and Isaac's journey and Sarah, but everyone walks through that. So it's wonderful to see the examples of what the Bible shows us of how people did survive that. Yes. You know, cartons of milk, when you get them, there's an expiration date punched onto the surface. We don't have an expiration date written on our foreheads, but we all do have one. May we learn to commend those we love to the future. We'll see them again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your insight today. We end our program with this. We want to see you again, but until then, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So I'll cherish the Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday 